so much, Hoda. Um, and it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Carla Mappy today. Uh, we have a very long history um, and relationship with uh, Professor Mappy, uh, who has been an avid uh, kind of proponent and supporter of uh, the journal Verge uh, that started here at Penn State with Tina Chun as the editor. and. Um, uh, Nap, uh, Professor Nappi is still on the editorial board and um, has been to several of our Global Asia conferences and so I, I feel like she kind of knows a lot of you already, <laughs> uh, so, but she's still, um, it, she's been doing so much uh, very interesting work that I think it's worthwhile to, to go over um, and just introduce you a little bit to all the different, uh, the many different guises of Professor Nappi as a scholar. Um, Officially, she's a historian, uh, but a historian who likes to, to try to understand the craft of history and really get into the nitty gritty behind writing and trying to break down traditional boundaries, especially dis the disciplinary boundary as history conceives it, or other people in other disciplines conceive of their own, own boundaries. Um, and to, uh, to, to to start working in what a space that she calls a disciplinarity. Um, so in that vein, uh, she's been doing a lot of things. Uh, first I'll, I'll do the unofficial guises of Professor Nappi, and then, then go to the official, uh, more historical, traditional uh, things. But the unofficial guises, she's been so active as the host of over 400 podcasts in two different series. Um, she interviewed me for at least two, um, and so I was uh, more than grateful to be a part of that. But this was the New Books in East Asian Studies uh, series, as well as the New Books in Science, Technology, and Society series. So over 400 of these, and she's an absolute master um, at uh, really getting into uh, the approaches and the ways various ways. And she's also uh, interviewed many of, of, of the professors here in the crowd. Uh, for this series, so thank you very much for that. Um, she's also what is known as a historical pataphysicist, pataphysicist at large, and you have an award for this in, uh, from Canada. I right? had, I, no, 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 I had a Canada research chair, and they make the mistake of letting you name your own Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, what do I do? I do historical pataphysics, and it doesn't exist, so someone in Canada will figure this out when I fill out the form. <laughs> they'll know, and they'll be like, that doesn't exist, but you should do early modern studies or something. I'll be like, fine, but nobody figured it out. So I was officially the Canada Research Chair of something that doesn't exist, but now it's it's amazing. it exists. amazing. now. <laughs> so we can talk more about this this approach, uh, pataphysics. I had to look it up, and I'm, I'm not going to go into it now. I'll let uh, Professor Nappy do that. So, so historical pataphysics. Um, and, um, and she's also the, the Andrew W. Mellon Chair in History at the University of Pittsburgh. Okay, so that's getting back into the more, the more uh, traditional stuff, but hopefully uh, in this new position that she's, she's just moved out here from the uh, University of British Columbia, um, uh, back on the kind of east-ish coast in cold weather, and um, getting used to trying to um, shake things up a little bit. Um, in not just the department, but the, the university at large. Uh, she also has a, a book, very interesting book, on a Chinese compendium of material medica called the Ben Cao Gang Mu uh, of the uh, Qing Dynasty. And it is Qing, yeah. Ming, Ming Qing. Ming, Ming, yeah, that is Ming, sorry. 1500, sorry. <laughs> um, That's what I and, for, um, this she's, um, She uses this book, uh, she uses this compendium uh, as a playground to explore the various creatures and uh, their medicinal uses in 16th century China. Recently she's also taken on a project that deals with translation, uh, taking Italo Calvino's Invisible Cities as an inspiration to write a history of translators and their practices in Ming and Qing China. Um, and she also has a, a project on poetry uh, dealing with a symposium. Uh, that's also underway uh, to, be, to be published. So with that, and there's many more things that I would love to get into, but I'll, I'll let Professor Nappi do it herself. And uh, let's welcome, give a warm up of applause to Professor Nappi. Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, first 
first of all, I know that it's a really busy time in the semester and I really appreciate all of you being here. So, does this work? Excellent. So what I'm going to do today is briefly introduce you to a research project. Okay, it's a research project called Remixing History. <laughs> I'm going to keep this relatively short so that we have lots of time for discussion afterwards. And to get there, we're going to travel through three main um, parts on the way. First, what I'll do is talk a little bit about, yes. Can you use the mic, maybe? Can, use the mic? Can I use, yes, I'm supposed to do that. And I, <laughs> I'm going to use the mic, I'm so sorry. Um, give me one sec, I'm going to put and it on. Uh, yeah, I can, yeah. Just the like, gender technologies, you're supposed to have a lapel. Okay. Mm -hmm. No lapels. It's fine. Right. We're not going to talk about the feminist project yet. Hello, can you hear me? Is that good? Yes? I'm going to restart. Hello, thank you. <laughs> thank you for being here. If I talk like this, can you hear me too? Is that good? Okay, excellent. So, this is where we work, remixing history. Um, we're going to have three parts to get to the end of the talk today. First, what I'll do is talk a little bit about the broad context of this project that we'll end with. And this touches on some of what Professor Brinley um, was talking about before, the kind of larger um, set of projects that this is part of. And they all are related, even though they might not seem that way initially, and I will take you there. Then I'll very, very briefly introduce you to the case study that forms the heart of the project. And this is a Manchu language text on bodies and their relationships. Um, so we'll talk about that as well. I'll sort of take you through the text a little bit and talk a little bit about why this particular text is at the heart of the larger project that we'll talk about. And then finally, I'll talk about the scope of the Remixing History Project, which is a larger book project as it's conceived right now on the craft of the historian that's just started to come into focus during my phobatical year this year. And yes, you can use that word. It's when you have a teaching release, but you still have to do all the service stuff, so phobatical. So this has been great for helping this project come into focus. So this is a comparative project, okay? But rather than conceiving, and it's very explicitly and very deliberately a project of comparison, but instead of conceiving comparison in terms of language or in terms of area, right? Chinese studies, um, early modern, whatever, French studies. Um, instead, it's trying to think comparison in terms of forms of practice. The practice of the paleontologist, the practice of the butcher, the practice of the DJ, and the way those forms of practice are related to um, and can inform how we think about and practice the practice of the historian. So that's ultimately what this project is about. Okay, and we can talk about that later because like, in a lot of ways that's really at the heart of what I'm trying to think through right now. So let's start with the context. Now a lot of my work right now is oriented toward thinking about, um, as Professor Brinley mentioned, uh, the basic elements of what the craft of the historian is, has been, and could be. So if I were a class in a history graduate curriculum, I'd be the methods class, right? That's what I've always been interested in, is methodology and craft and practice. Now right now, what I've been interested in for some time now is reading as part of that. Now, reading is something that a lot of us kind of professionally take for granted, right? You can't list it on the CV um, in this neoliberal capitalist era of like professional capitalist academia. The things that we get credit for do not include the thing that a lot of us need to spend a lot of our time on, and that's reading stuff, right? Um, but I'm really deeply interested in reading as creative practice as well, and the possibilities of playing with reading and what it could be um, as a form of creative practice um, that's part of historical practice. Now at this point in my career as a historian, I'm really less interested in disciplinary fields or areas and I'm more interested in, again, thinking about history as practice and increasingly as a kind of form of um, art practice. Okay? So right now, what I'm going to take you through as a kind of broader context of the project that I'll end with is a set of projects that are really at the core of this larger goal of rethinking scholarly life as art practice. Okay, that's what this is about. And they're all in some way about reading as part of this. Um, so recently in a series of projects, alone but also with different collaborators, 
I've been involved in experiments about, or experiments around the idea of reading, what it is to read. Illegible Cities is this book monograph on translation um, that you heard about just a little while ago. This is a book of history that's sort of half history, half fiction, that reads documents that we don't typically think of as genres of storytelling, okay, grammars, um, language primers, glossaries, and it reads them as sources for and elements of the narrative structure of telling an account of the history of translation in early modern China, and it explicitly uses fiction as part of the craft. So what this book does, and people, when I present this to history departments and groups of historians, people are either like, yay, all of us are fiction writers, or they're like, no, this is not history. Um, it imagines that we gather together seven or eight translators into a room, and they're going to take turns telling each other their stories using a, a text that they've brought with them, and often it's a text that they've written. So sometimes, um, and the chapter follows the structure of that text. So sometimes it's in the form of a topically oriented glossary. One chapter is in the form of a grammar, etc. But it's an explicitly fictionalized premise that has these historical figures get up and dance and play drums, etc. So it's really deliberately trying to push the boundaries of what historical writing can be. Um, and that's one project. And I'm happy to talk really about any of these that I'm going to just kind of sprinkle into the room afterwards if you want. Translating Vitalities, this is Jens. Um, Translating Vitalities is a collective of anthropologists, medical practitioners of various sorts, historians, and artists working in different media, so from media art to ceramics, um, and we have some painters and book artists as well, that come together periodically to collaborate on projects together. So this is Jens, who's a practicing physician based in London, um, and it's a still from a video that's part of a multimedia project that explores what an artist, a doctor, an anthropologist, and a historian are doing when they come together and they're all reading the same text. And I can talk about that as well. So this is very much um, a kind of art exhibit and ongoing project that's about what we're doing when we read the same thing. Hello, Jens. Wormholes, um, and we're almost to, we're almost done here. Wormholes is a brand new collaboration with Chicago-based artist Deanna Creed, where the two of us are working with rare books materials in different locations that have been damaged by insects. So we're going into archival collections and libraries and asking just to see the really insect damaged stuff. Okay? Um, so we're, the project is figuring out how to read with and through wormholes. And the double meaning of that as a kind of time travel um, is deliberate, right? That's part of the project. So here, um, and you can see some of this. These are two images from the first trip we took to the Newberry Library. Um, and you can kind of see some of the holes in there, okay? So what we're trying to do, out um, here we have the worms creating um, an island that wasn't there otherwise, here in this, um, in this atlas. So part of what we're trying to do is read these texts so that the worms are punctuators. Right? The way you would punctuate a, a sacred text, sort of consuming the text and making it sacred as a result of that. We have worms as cartographers. Um, we have lots of different ways. Worms as astronomers um, producing constellations. So this project is very much about playing with what it is to read and taking these texts as material objects and reading with and through the wormholes. Okay, so the project will eventually become at least one artist's book or books um, and related media, and we're just at the beginning. Um, so these are from a trip to the Newberry Library, and we're heading to Oaxaca in May for two weeks to work with materials there um, to help us think through these issues in the context of larger issues of access and immigration as well. And I can talk about that as well. Symposium Reimagined, um, or what we're actually tentatively titling as of this morning, Uninvited, um, is a collaborative book of poetry co-written with philosopher Carrie Jenkins, where we've read and rewritten the speeches in Plato's Symposium as poems that center the presence and voices of women. Um, so we're currently at the stage of things where we just this morning sent out our written response to the reader's reports for the press, um, and I'm happy to talk more about this project and all the challenges of this project um, because it really does right now, for me, embody the particular professional challenges 
of using poetry to do scholarly work um, and of trying to work across these different genres as part of scholarly <coughs> practice in academia today. And finally, Meta Gestures. So this is a book of short fictions um, co-written with cultural theorist Dominic Patman um, where we are trying to use short fiction as a way to write about and read with theory. So what we've done is we've read um, together Willem Flusser's book on the theory of gesture and produced 16 pairs of short stories, one for each gesture in this book, that try to open up little worlds where we can think about and test our ideas about, um, his ideas about the theory of gesture. So there are, this is gonna be out um, next month, I think, and there are 16 pairs of stories on like the gesture of planting, the gesture of smoking a pipe, the gesture of turning a mask around. Um, and so this is a way of experimenting with using fiction again to read theory. Now this project in particular leads us to the project today and leads us into this um, set of Manchu texts that I'll be talking to you about. In this project, I worked really closely with the theory of gesture by Flusser, okay? And this is what came out of that for me, and it came out of a process of fictioning with this text. So here, I'm going to lay this out on the table, important, in a moment. Here we go. Reading is a way of paying attention. A thing, an object, a text, another self, becomes itself as a result of the attention we pay to it. In paying attention in particular ways, we recognize certain gestures that speak across localities. In recognizing one of these gestures, we recognize ourselves. So that moment, that act, that event, that practice of recognition of the other is simultaneously a recognition of the self. Okay? This is at least according to some of the work of Husser um, that's really inspired how I think about this. Now in that moment, that event, of self-recognition, we populate the world with gods. We call down divinity in the broadest possible sense of the word. This is Flusser's idea. We enchant the world. Okay? In recognizing ourselves, we enchant the world. So put another way, reading is a creative act stemming from a practice of paying attention that allows ourselves to recognize ourselves in the world and thus to enchant it. Okay? This came from this project. Um, working with Flusser. So when I say that my work um, in the project that we'll get to today is about reading as creative practice, and as a creative practice of attention, it's part of this larger sensibility. This is why I brought you into this larger constellation of projects, and it's part of a scholarly commitment to exploring the practice of reading as a core part of what I do as a historian. Okay? Now these very different projects may not seem on the surface to have much in common beyond that, but as, I'll hope, as I hope you'll kind of see by the end of this, a lot of what I'll be showing you today is very much about the metamorphoses that come from proximity. Okay? With bringing together of disparate things on multiple scales as a form of productive creative metamorphosis. Okay. So this brings us to the case study um, that forms the project, uh, the core of the project I'm talking about today. Mm -hmm. So we've just talked about the importance in my work right now of reading as a practice of attention that makes a text or a document into itself and thus shapes the stories that we tell with the text or document. Now in particular, as kind of part of this larger project, I'm really interested in the way reading practice is a sensory mm -hmm. practice and in the way that sensory forms of attention help us attend to the world in different ways. Now, I've been working with this text in particular to do this. Okay, so this is a text, right? We're going to zoom in here, but first I'm going to just kind of zoom out. This is a text in a language called Manchu. How many of you have, like, seen Manchu stuff? You know what I'm talking about when I say Manchu. Raise your hands. Not raise your hands. Okay, super briefly, Qing Dynasty, middle of the 17th century, beginning of the 20th century. The major language, the official language, was Manchu. Okay? Most of this stuff was Manchu and Chinese, but there's lots of literature from that period that's in a language that looks like this, okay, or it looks like the top row up there of this page of the dictionary. So Manchu is really interesting if you are somebody who wants to look at Chinese history as a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic space that's not just about the Chinese language, right? So a lot of us who study Qing history came to that period because we're interested in moving beyond the archive of Chinese language materials to understand what has become China. 
So it's a really, Qing history is a really interesting space for that. Um, and so for me, I'm interested in Manchu in particular as part of that larger history. And Manchu is really interesting because it was used as a medium to translate in all possible senses of that word, ideas, texts, practices that were related to the natural world and its relationship to humanity um, in lots of different genres. So what I'm showing you here is just a mnemonic for me to remember to mention some of those genres for you, but they're also examples of texts that I'm working with. So this is a page of a dictionary um, that has five different languages of um, the Qing Empire. We've got Manchu, we've got Tibetan, we've got Mongolian, we've got Uyghur, we've got Chinese, and there are sections in this dictionary for how you translate vocabulary um, about curses, right? So let's say if you're interested in the history of the human body being part of a history of expletives that invoke and transform body parts, right? So when I say, let's say, I'm gonna, I don't mean this, I don't mean this, but when I, like, how would you take something like this? You maggoty, maggot bone, right? But she's not, like, Erica is not a maggoty, maggot bone. But when I do that, what I'm doing is performing a kind of metamorphosis where the words themselves are like making you into that somehow, right? So it's like the work that a curse does and its relationship to parts of and metamorphoses of the human body. There's a whole section of those and like how you translate them into five different languages in this dictionary. That's one of many, many kinds of things that are in here. Um, it's a whole like pages and pages of onomatopoeia, <laughs> how you translate sounds. So this is just to say, if you're interested in the way language or languages are used to convey understandings of and transformations of bodies in the world, this is one really cool kind of source to do that. There's also collections of poems. This is um, a one page from a manuscript at Harvard Yenjing um, on by this Manchu poet who writes a lot about the natural world and how much it sucks to be a translator and like how poor he is of Manchu poetry. There is up here a Manchu translation of a rhymed um, set of poems that are meant to help you remember the qualities of medicinal drugs in Chinese. Okay? Um, and this is just a multilingual Tibetan language book about Mongolian materia medica from the early 19th century that uses Manchu um, in addition to other languages to translate the names of objects. Um, so this is just to say, if you're interested in transformation, <coughs> bodies, translation, and the natural world in early modernity, Manchu is a super cool language to work in, and this is what brings me to that language. But um, for this project, we're going to focus on this, okay? Um, so this was one of the images that I showed you here. Um, this is a book on, it's, it's often translated as the Manchu Anatomy. Um, it's an early 18th century book that is about body parts and their translations, um, and it's all in Manchu. All right, and this is what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. I'm not going to read to you this. This is information about the text. I'm just going to talk you through it briefly. I lied, I'm reading it to you. That's the Manchu um, name of this text. Anyone who works on Chinese here will I probably identify from the sound. Right? That's a Manchu vacation of a Chinese name. But that's a lot of Manchu titles and texts in this period do that. There was no Chinese version of this text. From the beginning, it was only written in Manchu. Later, um, I think there's a Mongolian version of it somewhere. But this is to say, this is a Manchu text. The title invokes Lu um, as a kind of Chinese as a Chinese term that is transliterating, but it's not a Chinese text. It's a Manchu text. Um, it was imperially, or that's the the uh, translation of it, produced at the Kangxi court. Now, if you look up this text and you get really excited, yay, an anatomical text in Manchu, I have to work on it, what you're going to find are claims that it was authored by Jesuits. Okay? And these are the Jesuits who are given credit for this text. Practically speaking, this was a text that I prepared to as co-authored. Um, this was a text where Kangxi, the emperor, personally requested every 10 pages. And we have a manuscript with his like red handwriting where he corrected the grammar of these Jesuits every 10 pages and gave it back to them. Um, it, it's un, um, I can't imagine that the Manchu language teachers that were assigned to these Jesuits were not helping with this text either. Um, so functionally speaking, I treat this text 
um, and that's how I'll present it to you as co-authored, but if you're looking it up, these are the named authors who give credit for it, okay? So what is this text? Um, because this is the focus of this project. The text is in two main parts, um, and the images that I'm going to show you as we briefly go through this um, before we get to the end um, are from a manuscript of the first part that are kept in the National Library of France, um, and this is totally more than 600 manuscript pages. And I gave them like a long and like whatever a kidney to get this high quality scan. And I'm happy to share it if anyone's working on this text because that's what we do in Manchu studies. Share things, so just let me know. But these are what those are from. All right, um, so volume one is the upper part. There's a section on how the body's put together, and here there's this whole introduction to the idea of a divine creator, the creation of humankind, um, the whole divine watchmaker stuff is in here in Manchu, there's an account of the circulation of blood, there's an account of the dissection of frogs, it's really, really cool if you're interested in um, kind of Jesuit history, actually. Then there's sections that go down and successively take us through parts of the body, so the head and the neck, shoulder and arm, breast and belly, lower back, lower leg, and what you're seeing here is you see these images. These are, um, most of the pages in this text are not illustrated, okay? And so because of that, um, not because of that, most of the pages are not illustrated, but because the illustrations are so interesting, most of the attention that this text has gotten has been from people who are interested in the images. Okay? Most of the questions that I get are often from people who are interested in the images. Um, but there's like almost 600 pages that are not illustrated that are just texts that are also interesting. So that's mostly what I work on. But what you're seeing here when you see these, these are illustrations from the parts of the text that I'm naming over there that give you basically that label the parts of what's being depicted and then explain in uh, Manchu what those parts are there. So you'll see um, the little here, right, little indications, and then up there if you follow, that tells you what part that's pointing to. And that's what all these images are, and I'm happy to talk more about this text if you want, but that's basically what's going on. Okay, lower back, lower leg, and then a whole bunch of organs, okay? Large intestine, stomach, and spleen, et cetera, et cetera. We go inside the body, and then there's a whole discussion of blood and what I'm calling spirit here, but if you're interested in like the Chinese qi, the Manchu Sutun is the term used to translate that more, most often. And so there's a whole discussion here of Sutun um, and blood, um, which is really interesting for various reasons. And I know some of you might be interested in blood, and so we can talk about that if you want later, but I'm not going to talk about that too much now. Okay, there's also another part of this text. I'm not working with this closely right now, but there are, because it's harder to find manuscript copies of this, but there's a whole set of discussions of history of medicine, diseases of various sorts, and their prescriptions in this as well. Okay, so my interest in this text right now is that there's a lot of interesting material here that is trying to make sense of and figure out how to translate, okay? knowledge about the senses and how they produce knowledge about the world. I'm not going to give you, like, if this were like a 60 minute or like if you were stuck with me for an hour and a half, right, I would take you through specific examples. You're not stuck with me for an hour and a half. But basically, if you're interested in the details, there are accounts in this text of the way that when skin forms on the body, for example, it's just like what happens if you leave a bowl of milk out. Um, warm milk out in the cold air and it curdles. Um, it describes the way the skin feels as um, being related to what the brain does when it thinks. So it explicitly puts cognition like in the skin. Um, there's a whole really interesting discussion that uses Manchu architectural terms to name the parts inside the nose and sort of treats the inside of the body as a space you can dwell in and feel things in. So there's this is just to say, there's so much interesting stuff going on here. It's such an interesting text if you're interested in um, everything from translation, right, to bodies, to the way that we describe and understand sensation in comparison to the way we understand other ways of being in the world, right? To live in a space, to think with your skin, etc. So this is one of the really um, important reasons that I'm interested in this text. 
So a lot of that material, or there's, a, there's an interesting concentration of that material um, in this part of the text on the head, and this forms the basis of this larger project that I promised to get to um, that forms the title of my talk, and that is Remixing History. And I'm going to take a sip of water as I prepare to take you through this. Okay, so Remixing History. This project is all about how sensory forms of attention that are embodied in reading practices shape how we tell stories about text and their relationship to history as craft. Now, I'm calling the project Remixing History because the core of this project, where it was born from, was experience as a DJ. Um, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a moment. So this was born from um, an extended period where I was really thinking about how similar the craft of the DJ and the craft of the historian are um, in the process of learning how to DJ myself and then like studying this. Okay, so this is currently a kind of comparative history project that, as I mentioned before, makes comparison across forms of practice rather than temporal or geographic area, moving away from area studies as a motivator and disciplinary ground, just to see what happens when you work on China and you do that. Okay. Now it's explicitly a feminist project. I can tell you more about that if you want. And it's also a project that embodies what I've taken to call historical pataphysics. And I'm also happy to talk about that as well. It's on my official name card now. I'm the official, unofficial historical pataphysicist at large on my fit name cards which I'm super happy about that. Now, this seems to be taking shape as a book about the figure of the individual historian. It's at that scale explicitly, her reading practice, and the way that reading practice resonates with and can be informed by the practices of other figures that populate the book and its argument. And it kind of proceeds almost in a way that you would proceed through the major arcana of a tarot deck. And tarot is very much um, an inspiration for how this book is coming together. So we have the historian as the DJ. Now here, documents are materials that can be remixed. Translation is a kind of remixing technology. And attending to documents from this orientation becomes a way to explore the relationships between bodies, language, time, and their metamorphoses in history. Now for this chapter, I'm in the earliest stages of trying to read these Manchu documents, especially the Manchu anatomy specifically. Um, and tell stories with them by thinking about the resonances between the remixing crafts of the historian, the DJ, and the translator. And ultimately, and this is really important, and this is often what people are like, what do you mean by that? And I'm happy to explain that. By using digital DJ technology, and this in particular, um, this is a tractor uh, DJ controller, to, as a technology to compose history with. So this is about, in part, using this technology to work with um, and compose history literally um, with documents, okay? and with Manchu documents in particular. Now I've spent hours and hours and hours anatomizing and sampling and mixing songs, keeping a lab notebook, um, recording my efforts as a kind of autoethnography and thinking about how the ways I've, I'm using my mind and body and, and forms of attention in DJing music can be translated into how I might use them when working with documents to tell new kinds of stories with them. So this is a really important transformation in the project that came with Fogadical. Initially, what I thought I was going to do was like somehow read the documents into this, manipulate the documents with the um, technology, and then just kind of play the documents through the technology. And it became really clear um, soon after I started working with this that that's probably the most superficial level at which to understand the work that this technology can do. That's just not, it's not as interesting to me as it is to try to understand forms of practice used in this and then translate them to what's happening with documents. And again, I'll, I can talk more about that. So I've given a couple of performance talks about this chapter. And in that, I've experimented with showing the room one image from the Manchu anatomy. This one, this is about eye parts, um, eyeballs, then taking it apart and sampling and remixing it in a number of ways that have come directly from the durative experiment of the past several months, working with this DJ technology. And in doing that, by the end of the demonstration, hopefully enabling the room to actually perceive the document differently. Okay? So for example, what happens if you read, if you attend to this page as a caretaker of minor divinities? 
right? This is one of the things that I've done in performance lectures about this, okay? So you have the god of sprouting seeds. You have the god of hearts that grow inside apples. The god of macarons. A god of tiny coliseums built by tiny insects to stage their tiny plays. The god of little planets that grow from the ground but only grow halfway before getting tired, falling asleep, and dreaming the rest of the minor pantheon into and out of being. Okay. And then we're back to the text. So the idea here is not that that was what the writers intended this the text to be, right? The idea instead is that taking a document, telling stories with it, and then bringing it back together changes how we see it or read it as a historical document, and thus changes the kinds of stories that we can tell about it and with it as historians. And this has become a really significant part of my practice of uh, working with documents. And so in that performance, PowerPoint also becomes a kind of artist tool, right? Resonant with I just love talking about the fact that David Byrne of the Talking Heads wrote a whole book about PowerPoint as an artistic medium. So I've been trying to take that to heart and also work with PowerPoint. So that's the historian as DJ. And as we come to the close, another chapter figures the historian as paleontologist, thinking about the ways that sedimentation processes help shape our forms of attention and determine how we recognize things and thus how we recognize ourselves and the stories we tell with them. So here, um, and at my training, my first, my undergraduate degree was in paleontology. So I'm kind of going back to that, um, thinking with fossils to understand how practices of sedimentation and recognition might be important to how we think about the notion of context and how we produce the notion of context as a historical object. Now I've been thinking a lot about the relationship between rock and time and the way that particular materializations of time shape how we recognize the world and thus the entities that we recognize in it, including ourselves. Now in this one, and I'm gonna just show you like super quick images, I've been working with poetry as a medium um, to sort of think about the ways that the poetic line is also a kind of sedimentary strata. So what happens if we work with poetic lines as sedimentary strata? Um, like really, um, and this is, large, this is related to what's happening um, in the symposium project. So one series of poems in this collection is trying to tr literally treat poetic lines as sedimentary strata. Um, so this, I'm not gonna read you this poem, I'm just showing you there, because if there's anyone in here who's like, I really want you to read me a poem, I can read you the poem later. Um, this is just an example, but this is part of a series of 14 poems that get longer and lo longer by two lines as you go down the series, sedimenting in a way before eroding away at the end to a fragment from Sappho. Okay, and I can, sh I can talk about that if you want. Um, but back to this project, right? What I'm trying to do here is think about context as a sedimentary process that preserves a document and, and to read from that perspective. There's also a chapter um, on the divine busher, right? The figure in Zhuangzi for the China scholars who like understands the, like how to butcher an ox so well that his knife never dulls. It's like when he goes in, he just has to go like, and it all just falls apart, right? I'm really interested in that way of thinking about butchery, um, and in the way that the kind of skill and practices of recognition that lead up to the actual moment of reading a document is similar to that actual moment of the butcher, um, and might help read documents in a certain way. And since I'm already over 30 minutes, I'm not going to talk too much more about that. We're going to end here. Um, I've just briefly shown you three of what will become many more figures um, that go into this book. Words, 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 um, and I'm going to um, close here. So what I wanted to do here is give you a brief introduction to a comparative project that's trying to work with Manchu texts without working in an area studies frame. And I'm happy to talk about any part of this, um, from remixing history to the poems to any part of the context that I've talked about to like Manchu stuff. And thank you. And now you get to talk, and we can talk together. So that's all. The end. So let's talk. So if you have any questions about anything, or you want to talk about that, is that absolutely? Yeah, we can open it up. We have about. 20 minutes for Q&A, okay. Oh, Chang, go ahead. 
Do you want to do you want to call on people, or should I do that? It's up to you. Okay. Hi. Um. Thanks for the talk. Uh, fascinating point. But actually, when you mentioned remixing history, it immediately reminds me of a book uh, written by you know, Nicolas Boreal, like mm -hmm. a French curator critic, mm -hmm. in 2002, named Post Production, in which he discussed how contemporary artists or DJ mm -hmm. imagery, they're huh. actually like um, remixing and DJ <coughs> images and visual culture instead of. Okay. Well, it's artists. called post production? Post production, yes. Yeah. So, and I think it's very similar to what you were doing here. And your scholarship, in a way, is really kind of becoming sort of um, similar to performance art or this type of conceptual archival oriented art that many people practice in today. So and I think that's a you know fascinating opening. And do you I guess my question is um, so do you think that in your attempt to dissolve disciplinary boundaries you're actually kind of blurring scholarship with art practice or do you still see if there's any some kind of you know Boundary or limitation. Oh, you thank you. Yeah. Explicitly, right? Explicitly. I think on my official UPIT website, I describe what I'm doing as an art practice. So I'm, I'm, I'm very explicitly trying to bring those two together. Um, and we were, we were talking about this a little bit last night. Um, I am in a particularly unprecarious situation in that I can do this publicly and probably trust that I can still pay my mortgage right when I go home. And that is like having tenure um, makes a difference to some of this. Um, no, I just want to be blunt and like put that on the table because I get asked about that a lot. The, one of the reasons that I'm trying to be so explicit about this is to try to create a space for other people to also be doing work that transgresses those boundaries. And the reason why I increasingly, the more that I present work like this, feel like that's worth doing, is that the more I present work like this, the more I, I meet and find other people who are also academics, who also have like an art practice on the side that is not supposed to come into your scholarly work, or they like got into this business because they really wanted to be like a writer or a musician, but then in the part of your training, you're, you're like trained to cut those parts off of you because you're not supposed to bring that into the room. Um, and so like people are miserable and we wonder why, right? Um, when I mentioned that this was part of a feminist project, Part of what I mean by that is a project that's explicitly trying to bring into the room a lot of things that I think a lot of us, I know I'm not the only person, are trained to keep out of the room. Right? You're not supposed to get emotional in your work. You're not supposed to get angry. There's a whole bunch of parts of you that you're not supposed to bring in. Um, and explicitly these projects are bringing that in. And when I say it's scholarship as an art practice, really what it is is trying to bring from the very beginning into the production of the work the sensibility that like all of us know who have taken like a first year literature class, right? Which is like somebody's whole self in life is probably relevant to like what they write. Right? Like I'm like it probably matters what someone's life or life world was like when we read the text and like sometimes people are interested in that. Yes, and that's true of our work too. And why not put that in the middle of it? Um, and also I think like more and more like artists that I work with take seriously the media that we're working with as part of the object. We work with media, like the talk is media, right? Like this room, this is an event. And so part of saying that it's part of an artistic practice is really kind of simply just about trying to take that seriously and playfully and play with those media rather than taking for granted that like a, a talk is supposed to look a certain way or like a piece of scholarly work is supposed to have a particular form. I just think that's the yeah. yeah, I mean, so I wrote methodology. I think mm -hmm. behind that there is an epistemological question. Mm -hmm. So we care about methods because once we figure out the way to learn, to theorize what we are learning. Now, if you're talking about these various approaches, in a way that they do mix, then you are making a certain assumption about a certain <coughs> epistemological coherence. So in other words, 
you can do DJ, you can do paleology, and all sorts of things. Ultimately, in one way or another, they link up in such a way that they provide you with the best tool or a series of tools that enable the construction of a particular quote-unquote reality in a particular space and time, which is the point of doing history, isn't it? Um, I'm not sure that's the point of doing history, but continue and we can talk about All right, so, so if history is not giving shape to a certain past, in other words, things that happen in a particular space and time, then what is it? Now, of course, there are a variety of ways of arriving at that, and thanks to you, now our minds have been opened so that we, we can figure out a lot more ways of arriving. And to me, it has to be the same goal. Unless you have a different uh, definition of what the act of doing history actually is all about. To me, it's, there's only one definition, and that is to recreate, reconstruct a particular reality that was located in a certain space and time. So. That, that's one question. So, so what's where the, is what's the, so what's the it sounded more like a comment. So what's the no, uh, so where is the uh, is there where like, is, is that true? Where, no, no, where where is the epistemological coherence that can be drawn from your multidisciplinary approach? What is the epistemological coherence? Yeah, and you're figuring epistemological coherence as uh, as what? Doing history. Mm -hmm. The theory of learning, which regard it, which we regard as a historical pursuit. So, so, doing literature mm -hmm. presumes a particular epistemology. Doing anthropology presumes yet another. So, my point is that when you're talking about historical methodology, the assumption mm -hmm. is that via certain methods we can actually get at a particular epistemology, a theory of knowledge. So maybe that's your assumption, but I don't yeah. think that's the assumption that historians are need to make in practicing their craft, or that we need to make when understanding what and why and how history is. So I'm not sure okay. that I, I agree that it's okay. no, 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 I'm, I'm just so asking. Well. No, of course. Um, but, you were, but you had a second question. So the first one, the answer might be no. So, but you had the second question. <laughs> what was your second question? No, I, I, I'm totally fascinated about what you're yeah. doing. No, but, 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 but I, 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 I keep think, thinking, Hayden White's, you know, 1975 book, Mesa History. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that, you know, after the linguistic turn, essentially, in one way or another, historians have been sort of rendering, uh, you know, history in different ways and such that, in such a way that we, 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 we get a fact of history as opposed to the front side of history. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering, you know, whether what you're doing actually, in particular, which is, you know, Hayden White's coin, to manipulate a series of very imaginative metaphors mm -hmm. so as to illustrate what actually did happen. <coughs> because ultimately, this book really is about metaphor. So your divine <coughs> butcher is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. The butcher in Zhuangzi is a metaphor. Cutting up the arts is a metaphor. Mm -hmm. Mixing music is a metaphor. When is applied to the doing of history? Is it not? But anyway, so I, I'm, I'm just simply saying that, you know, in some ways, whatever you're doing, in some ways, is a very, very useful and meaningful manipulation of different kinds of metaphor to illustrate, essentially, what historians are trying to do. Well, thank you for that. Um, thank you for that. And I'm, I have to think more about how I feel about metaphor here. I mean, I think that's a to really get into that and decide is what I'm doing really about metaphor. I would have to give that a lot more thought um, than just to see with the pants. But I'll think with that. I'm inter I, I just wrote a piece on allegory mm -hmm. um, and history, mm -hmm. um, and I would want. I think it deserves that kind of focus thoughtful attention, and so thank you for that. Thank you. Um, thank you. 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 I mean, for example, historians are becoming more and more self-reflective about their own practice, and that's why we got like Hayden White, 
talk about poetics of history, right? So there's this pushback this from, from like more, from, from other historians who say, okay, so this is getting too homo, I can't take this. But at the same time, we also see that from the literary side, we also see writers who are becoming more and more interested in history. So we are like, just that they're not like fictional writers in a, in a, in a conventional sense. So we had, uh, for example, the Belarusian writer, uh, Svetlana Alexevich, also at the same time, because I'm working on this Hong Kong writer who has produced this really interesting work on a certain, who was actually not making stuff up. She's actually going back to the colonial archive and then massively collaging the text and really question history. What is the history behind that riot that people no longer talk about in Hong Kong, actually? And really resurrect that kind of historical memories and forgetfulness within it. And I think that that's a very interesting point. And um, so, to really formulate my question, I will put it in two ways. The, the first is really an invitation for you to talk about um, the concept of historical pedagogy. I think I saw some outreach mm -hmm. there. And also, that, uh, on, on, the, on the other hand, also, uh, for most specific question, I want to see that kind of institutional entanglement between literature, between literature and, <coughs> honestly, academic knowledge. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's is, given the time that we have, would you prefer that I address that question, or would you prefer that we have a live question collectivize. collectivized? It's up to you. Yeah. you collectivize? Option We're going to collectivize just because of time, but not because I don't really want to talk about this with you. So when, after we collectivize, we'll talk, and if we don't, you know, then come up to me afterwards and we can talk more about it. Thank you. I think we go you next. Yeah. Um, can you double down a little bit on reading? So if I, if I got you uh, uh, correctly, on the one hand, uh, you say uh, 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 reading as a practice of paying attention as something that does something. On the other hand, uh, 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 reading uh, comes from from sensory. Uh, 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 so on the one hand, there seems to be perception involved in reading. On the other hand, uh, reading is not uh, uh, it is a passive; it's active. There is an agency involved here. Uh, what is the relationship between the, the perception and the action uh, 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 that you invest in in reading? Uh, I find this, this is a very productive uh, way of thinking about it. Super briefly on this, do you take perception to be passive? No. That's an answer. Right? I think that right, perception, sensory perception, and active practice aren't two different things. Well, but perception right. is not exactly practice either. Oh, but it can be related to formal practice. Yeah, it's Much related, more. but not equivalent. Well, but, okay, I'm going to collect more. Perhaps one or two more questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah um, so first of all, this is just a silly factual question that I could probably just look up online, but I'm going to ask you anyway because it's more fun. Um, is Manchu related to, um, does it come from Phoenician scripts? Is it related to Arabic? Because it looks like Arabic yeah. from here. Which it's, is like, one it's like, but it's vertical. Aramaic begat, some begat Sogdian begat, Uyghur, Uyghur scribes get taken into the Mongol Empire, begat Mongolian script, and then that gets taken into Manchu with some dots and circles. It gets like, like, yep. I'm like sitting here wanting to turn my head like this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so that was the factual, boring question. Um, mm -hmm. But the sort of more conceptual question is like, the way you're using sort of form as like, or I guess precisely sort of not making language metaphorical, but thinking about it as something more material than that. I mean, maybe ultimate metaphor. I don't want to say that you're not doing something metaphorical, but what I understand, um, at least part of what you're doing, is to play with language with kind of material substance. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering how that, where those intersections are between language as its material substance and your use of the body, both as a kind of something that comes out of the text, but also it sounds like something that you bring to the text. Mm -hmm. um, and so how the materiality of language and materiality of these various bodies um, come together, and maybe also sort of how you think about those things and what your sort of useful interlocutors, <coughs> whether they are sort of theoretical ones or from sort of outside our sort of theory space, so to speak, um, are for thinking about this. Thank you. Yeah. I want to go back to the historian's craft and the, the underlying kind of epistemological questions dealing with disciplinarity. So what would your <coughs> advice be to, because uh, most historians, I mean this might be a fiction, but I think they would think that ultimately the goal, and maybe it's not even achievable in, in most historians' minds, is to actually try to understand the other in a different time and space. 
and get into their shoes, understand the context in which they were living, and you know, just get to know as much as possible about what their reality was like. Of course, that we know kind of epistemologically that's impossible for a 21st <coughs> century person to ever really get into their shoes. How can we ever know what the ancients were doing, what they really thought, what they, um, I mean, but we do have these remnants, and that's what historians, that the fiction is that you, you, you're looking at this and you're gathering it together, and then productively, I mean, I think you would argue productively performing a kind of reenactment or something that, that is, is using that in, in an interesting way. But the, the problem is that historians think that, and, and they're going to be saying, well, you're just doing art. You are doing performance, and how does what you're doing tell us about what those guys in, in, who were writing these texts really wanted us to get to? I mean, there's this really thing, right? That's the kind of <laughs> implicit um, <clears throat> underlying, you know, that's what makes history, and that's why we're historians, and that's what gives us the authority to say what we're saying. So what would your advice be to these people who are trying to get over it? Like, maybe not they're not even trying to get over it, but that's how they would argue against you. What you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, should I? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a lot of, okay. so there's a lot of really, really interesting questions here. I'm going to start with the latter one, right? Um, as you were the, the last one, as you can imagine, um, I get that question a lot. <laughs> um, so the way when I first started doing this work, um, the just the bald you know, claim was this isn't history, it's art, like that's fine, it's not what we do. Um, and I used to be really defensive about that. Um, and I like I think the more time you spend on your work and the more you kind of figure out that your work has value regardless of that stuff, the more you put the less defensive you get, right? Um, for me, the kinds of conversations that my work is most helpfully part of, at least in my experience with um, history departments, and I, I give talks about this stuff to history departments all the time, it's often in conversations about method, about craft, about what it is that we're doing when we practice our work, and in my experience, like, historians are really interested in that, you know, like, we're not um, a group of people that are just about, like, we're going to tell the truth about the past, and we're not going to question how we do it, right? I mean, like, I, I, I've yet to meet a historian, honestly, I think, this is, I think this is probably true, I've yet to meet a historian who's not like interested and open to having conversations about how we do what we do. And so often when I present my work in that way and when people are listening generously, mm -hmm. we can have a really productive conversation about that. And that conversation does not end with a, and that's not history. <coughs> because any time we're talking about our craft, even if the object that we're producing is not an example of the history of China, it's still an object that's an example of historians talking about their work and thinking creatively and um, experimentally about what they do. And so the work really clearly fits within a historical discipline in that context. And so I've had really productive conversations. Now, what I do get a lot of pushback on is when I go into like, um, like a conversation of historians of Chinese medicine, right? Who really want me to tell them the story about the Manchu anatomy that looks a certain way. This was the author, this is the context of production at Kangxi's court, this is, these are all the social and cultural history questions that we, that in order to say anything in public about the Manchu anatomy, you must be able to talk about this and you must want or else it doesn't count. In those kinds of conversations, which are a product of listening that's not generous, then this is not going to fit in those conversations. And what I learned from those contexts is that I go to other conferences. <laughs> you know? um, but there's always, but one of the reasons for continuing to do this work and getting up there, even when I know people are going to be like, this doesn't count, right? Like in, a, in certain kinds of conferences, not in most is that there's maybe like two people in the audience who see this and they're like, oh, I wanted to do something different also well, with the text I'm working on, but like I didn't know you were allowed to do this, so maybe somebody else is doing this. And it's worth it. Like if it opens up that possibility for the two people, I can take the like, that's not real history. Actually, yes, it is. Like if, you know, does that start to get at? Um, Sorry. Yeah, there's another, rather than, like, there's other questions, should we take another one? Is that, um, or? It's really your call at this point. We're about <laughs> a minute shot. Tell me what you have to say. Yes, quick. 
Uh, yeah. Sorry, I am going to weigh this from a very different perspective. I'm an mm -hmm. early period uh, European person, but it, this discussion we're having reminds me a lot of conversations that are being had in early period studies about queer time and queer anachronism, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you know, you mentioned earlier in your paper, uh, in your presentation, that you were coming from an explicitly feminist perspective. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that and maybe any relationship you think your work has remixing history with queer theory and the idea of queer theory. Okay. So um, the most honest and truest answer that I can give to the last part of your question is that I know that this is relevant to queer theory and queer time, and I don't know how yet, I have to do a lot more reading, but in context of presenting this work in conversation with like early modernists, which is another one of my communities, that comes up, and it has come up recently um, enough that people are giving <coughs> examples of work on queer time that I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta read that, and it's like on my list of I gotta read. In terms of an explicitly feminist project, um, I can say, that, I'm glad that you brought that up because like you should ask what that means because there is no like a feminist project that self-evidently means something. Um, and I can tell you one of the things, and I know we have to be done, right? We have to wrap up the symposium project, right? right? Um, these are poems that are very explicitly about the fact that in this book, they send the food girl away. There's like sort of like priestess, ghostly diatoma that's kind of speaking for Socrates and stuff, and otherwise like there's no women, like don't, you know, don't. So my co-author and I submitted this to a press, wrote this whole introduction about this, and got like readers' reports back that are basically like one used the word. I'm gonna forget, I can use that, I can use phrase. One used the phrase "tripping on estrogen" to describe women <laughs> who were not postmenopausal, and there's all kinds of other stuff like that. My what I have learned from this process is that there's no one feminism, and there's lots of ways of being feminist, and there's lots of different ways. For me. Um, this is about bringing the whole human into the space, into the academic space, and it's about inclusivity and polyvocalness as much as possible. And my experience of that is that those issues have been tested in the same context that other issues about sort of identity and its relationship to womanness have also come in. And so for me, that includes like trying to break down those spaces and bring the whole self in. Um, is a feminist project. It's not the feminist project, and the more I talk about this, the more I'm not actually sure what a feminist project is, but it's precisely to have this kind of conversation that I know we're not a part of the conversation. Thank you. Um, I think we're out of time, even though it seems like there's still a lot of questions <laughs> that we'd love to ask of our speaker. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you.